everybody, here we are. We are live. Hello, all you people out in viewing land, and welcome to the live stream of the Pen Parentis Literary Salon for March 2023. If you are not in March 2023, you are watching us on a playback. So, hi. <laughs> um, today is Pi Day. Happy Pi Day, everyone. I hope you all did some math. And uh, this is the March 23 Literary Salon. So a big hello if you're watching in playback, and we are glad you're watching. And for our live audience, please take a second to put your city into the chat and say hi. Uh, you know, we, you can always chat with us, and we just want to prove it by like having you start sort of saying hello to us. And you know, we'll say hello to you too if we know you're out there. So and you can also click the little hearts and things, and we'll be able to see like your reactions throughout the show. So that would be great. Um, and I also have a big shout out to all the people who are watching because they discovered us at AWP. We see you. <laughs> and we also see Clydette DeGroat out there in the front row. So hi, hey, Clydette. Clydette. <laughs> also shouting out to Rebecca and Laura and Amy and Francesca. Thanks for donating on your way in. And hey, SRK from Portland, Oregon. See, see how, see how they did that? You guys should all do that. Um, Speaking of being seen, uh, thank you to the New York State Council on the Arts and to the DeGroat Foundation for their generous funding. And we have big news. We have big news. We have big news. We have won the trifecta. We have won the trifecta. Um, the New York State funding from NISCA, as you all know. And then we just got New York City funding from LMCC, which is the New York State Department of Cultural Affairs. They just gave us a creative engagement grant for this, this series. And we also, drum roll please, for the first time ever, whoa, 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 were whoa, whoa. funded, yes, by the National Endowment for the Arts. The NEA just gave us a Challenge America grant for $10,000. And the challenge is that we have to match it. So please stay tuned for that link. <laughs> and use it when it comes up or just go to our homepage at penprentice.org and click the donate button. We have conveniently colored it yellow so you can find it um, and it is tax deductible. Um, so let's see who else is in the chat. Cheryl Walsh, hello from Iowa City. Look at you people from all over the place. Thank you, thank you for saying hi. Um, okay, so in case you don't know and can't read, um, I am M.M. DeVoe, the founder and ED, see? of Pen Parentis, see how that works? And um, uh, in case you missed the huge conference we just attended in Seattle, uh, Pen Parentis is a national literary nonprofit that helps writers stay creative after they have kids. Da, 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 da. And one of our big programs is this literary salon in which we present fabulous authors who have kids and fabulous careers. And we ask them, how the heck did you do it? so that we can all be inspired. Um, yeah, so that's my spiel. So I am glad that you are all out there. And now it is time to say hello to Christina Chu, the author of the novel Beauty and the curator for this series. Yay! Everybody say hi, Christina. So, um, yeah, one of the things that I really love about this series is that we really focus on dispelling the whole idea that um, you need to be a parent uh, to be a good parent. You can't really be a writer, or you know, if you're a parent, a writer, you can't really be a parent. And which is like baloney, because <clears throat> we have excellent, amazing writers every salon, and they're all so inspiring. And this month we have especially wonderful people who we all know and love and. What's great about it is we have a very juicy topic, the wolves in our hearts, which we will all be speaking to. So I would like to introduce our authors quickly and um, start reading. How's that? We have um, Sergio Troncoso. He is the author of Nobody's Pilgrims, A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, and he's editor of uh, ne Nepantia Familias. Did I say that right? I said that right. Perfectly. Yes. And then we have Barbara Graham. She's the author of the new psychological thriller, What Jonah Knew. And finally, our first reader tonight is Dion Ford, who I know personally from many years ago. 
and then she's the author of the forthcoming memoir, Go Back and Get It. And she's the co-editor of the anthology, Slavery's Descendants, Shared Legacies of Race and Reconciliation. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Virginia Quarterly Review, Lit Hub, New Jersey Monthly, Rompus, and Ebony. She's won awards from the National Association of Black Journalists and the Newswoman's Club of New York. And she's received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Creative Writing. Everyone, please welcome Dion Ford. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me here. I'm really excited. So I know we don't have that much time, so I'm just going to get right into it. Here's my book. Go back and get it. And I'm going to read from it now. I'm going to just read from the prologue, which is pretty short. My prologue's called A Relation. If you are going to look for your enslaved ancestors, you will have to look for the people who enslaved them. Any African-American can expect that 19% of their ancestors were white men. So the enslavers might also be your relatives. This is a study in contrast, shadow, light, black, white, joy, pain, victim, perpetrator. You will find ephemera, editorials, photographs, wedding announcements, and atrocities, lynched uncles, your people as property in someone's will, deed, or mortgage guarantee. You will also find the living, third cousins once removed, fifth cousins straight up, and descendants of the family that forced your family into slavery. You will meet them on beaches, in dusty archives, in farmhouses, scratching at the past like it is a lotto game, and you are strokes away from a million more reasons to believe. For a time, you will cease to believe in or pray to God, and instead will pray to your ancestors, the enslaved ones, the women, because they are what you want to be, mother, creator, woman, divine. They were raped. They were sold away. They kept on living. Some even thrived. If you are going to look for your enslaved ancestors, you will have to reconsider the word lucky. In 1858, when Colonel W.R. Stewart, a wealthy Louisiana cotton broker, married Elizabeth McCauley, a girl from a long line of North Carolina plantation owners, her family gave the couple a slave named Tempe Burton as a wedding gift. Elizabeth was sickly and couldn't have children, but Tempe could and did have six of them with her new master, the Colonel. My great grandmother, Josephine, born a decade after slavery ended, was their youngest child. On my 38th birthday, I found their picture on the internet. It was May 7, 2007, and with all those sevens, I'd like to tell you that I was feeling lucky. Timpy was in the middle of the photo. Her former masters, Elizabeth and the Colonel, were sitting behind her. The one on the left was curly-haired and creamy-skinned like my dad and my daughters. It was eerie how this century-old photo of my ancestors mirrored the new family I'd created. Lucky and unlucky number seven. In seven days, God made the world. In seven plagues, God could wipe it out. On the 7th of May, I was born. In my seventh year, I was raped. It's been said that it takes seven years for every cell in your body to change. In the seven years after finding the family photo, I crisscrossed the country, uncovering the stories of the people in it, and a breach began to mend in me. There is a name for this kind of pilgrimage. The Akan of Western Africa call it Sankofa. Symbolized by a bird in flight with its head craned backward and an egg in its beak, Sankofa means to go back and get it, or it is not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten. Thank you. Whoa. Wow. That was wow. Cute. <laughs> wow. Bravo. Wow. Bravo. Beautiful. And we learned a new word. So. Yeah, Sankofa. That's that is useful. a word we should all know. Does um, that does that work? Is that just for a journey, or is that work for like? Can you use that word for like? I have I've left my keys. So no. So I mean, it's like a real. It's like a pilgrimage. It's like a huge it's pilgrimage. Yeah. It's 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 pilgrimage, and it's also a philosophy. It's a way of of life, and it turns out that it actually can also mean something else, which I talk about later in my book as well, which is 
Um, it can also mean uh, justice. Justice, wow. Wow. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, what what was the, how did you even start writing this book? Uh, when I met you, we, you weren't writing this. So, what, right. what was the impetus? How did this happen? You know, honestly, in a way, I've been writing this book since I could write. I've always been drawn to and interested in the stories of my family. I grew up living very close to my grandparents and on my maternal side. And I was kind of like fascinated by my paternal grandparents. They lived in New Orleans and it was always so interesting to go and visit them. And my grandpa, my paternal grandpa would tell me a little bit about his life growing up. So really from the first time he mentioned my great, great grandparents, his grandparents, Tempe and the Colonel, when I was 12, I just wanted to know about them. And so I really had been trying to find pieces of information here and there since he mentioned them to me when I was 12. And it's very difficult. Well, I should say it's getting a lot easier, but um, historically it's been difficult to find information about enslaved people. And um, so hence why it's taken me <laughs> my pretty much entire life. <laughs> it's so interesting because these kinds of stories, we think of them as history and your introduction made me go, oh my God, terrible people can be your family. Like it's your family, even though it's, they're terrible. Like yeah, absolutely. what a thing to have to hold in your head. In, that must have been so difficult as you were reading it because there's usually a joy in finding your ancestors. Mm. There's this like, yay, I'm related to this person, you know, as opposed to, wow. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I, I mean, obviously it was always so fantastic and healing for me to learn anything about my great, great grandmother, mm -hmm. the woman, Tempe, who had been enslaved. And I have to say, like finding out things about the Colonel, um, the man who enslaved her, you know, it was bittersweet because he did do some really um, interesting things that um, he should be proud of, you know, and he also did things that, you know, were reprehensible. So I, I think, though, every family probably has to contend with this. Right. And for me personally, from my own story, it's something that this is a reality that I've lived with, you know, since childhood that I um had someone in my family who, whom I love who'd also done something very terrible to me. Yeah, it sounds so familiar. Like, uh, you know, my, my mother uh, is from China and you hear a lot about um, war stories and, you know, questionable backgrounds. And um, it sounds so similar. Yeah. So similar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and how, how did you pass on this story then to your own children? like that they have this history in them as well. Like you're, well, you're not just writing a book. You've also got this whole family going. They had to come with me on a lot of these, wow. on a lot of these, you know, trips to find information. Mm -hmm. So they came with me um, at least once to New Orleans. An old age-ish when That's, they were doing this. So when I started uh, really starting to like go places and um, mm -hmm. explore, uh, my oldest was seven and my youngest was four. Whoa. So those, those um, research trips were couched as vacation. <laughs> 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 and uh, they, they started to get hip to, you know, why are we always going to vacation at a place where it, it's a library? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is not fun. And so by the, time, by the time the oldest was like 12, I had to start doing things like, I swear after we do this, the next location is Disney. I um, did actually take them to Disney after, so after one uh, vacation to an archive <laughs> in, in uh, the Eastern Shore really? of Maryland. That's <laughs> super funny. It is so wonderful. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much, Dion. We'll come back. We're going to talk more to you, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. In a moment. Um, thank you. Our next reader, however, is Sergio Troncoso. Very good 
friend of ours. He's been here before. Um, he's the author of Nobody's Pilgrims, A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, and like I said, the editor of Nepantia Familias, an anthology of Mexican-American literature on families in between worlds. He's a Fulbright scholar and past president of the Texas Institute of Letters. Yay, Texas! Well, good Texas, but yay, Texas. <laughs> the good Texas, the writer, the literary Texas. Am I holding two ideas right. in my head at the same time? Oh, oh. so Troncosa um, has two sons. So everyone, please welcome Sergio Troncosa. Yay, Sergio. Thank you. So uh, grateful to be here with uh, Dion and Barbara and Christina and Milda. I'm thrilled to be part of Pen Parentis. Um, and I'm, I'll just get to it so we can have a, a nice discussion and maybe people will ask questions. I'm reading from the middle of this novel that came out last year. And, and so I'm going to just very briefly uh, set it up. Uh, these three teenagers, uh, the middle one, Duty, is Mexican-American, and he meets Arnulfo, who's an undocumented immigrant on the right side, I guess. Um, and he, um, they steal a pickup. And they drive across country in search of their American dreams. As they're driving across country, they meet Molly, this poor white girl in rural Missouri, and she joins them. And they're also carrying contraband in the truck that they don't know about. So there's this evil people, the wolves, so to speak, coming after them. And, and so it's really a, a novel about grit and survival and, and creating a community among outsiders. So I, the piece I'm going to read, very, very short... They, they've never been to Connecticut, but, but they start on the border. And, and a lot of the, uh, these kids are bookworms. They love to read. In fact, uh, for two of them, Molly and Tootie, um, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is one of their favorite books. So they keep riffing off scenes off each other as they're in the truck. And so they, they stop at this McDonald's in Connecticut after going across country. And of course, McDonald's is like, they said, that's not really what we meant by New England and Connecticut. And so this is what happens. Um, Molly goes over to a couple. Um, this couple gives them a Yankee magazine. And, and so she brings it over. And so then they, uh, they start talking about it. And then something happens. And, and that's really the scene. Judy picks up the magazine and reads the cover article from last year, The Best Towns for Fall Foliage. It focuses on a place called the Litchfield Hills and towns with names like New Milford, Kent, Cornwall, Warren, Washington, Depot, Goshen. A magazine is going to tell us where to go? You have any better idea, Nulfo? This is actually pretty good. Look at these pictures. Wow, reminds me of the book Mrs. Garcia showed me. Molly, gosh, thank you. La Molly Milagrosa. They're a very nice couple, or here they come. The man jams the baseball hat on his head as he wends his big body through the tables and chairs. You all from Missouri, too? The man says, his wife standing behind him to one side. His temples are gray, and wiry gray hairs protrude from his hat. A pouty harump-like frown rests between his rosy cheeks. Mike, let's go. He ignores his wife behind him, staring intently at the two teenage boys, waiting for an answer. We're from Texas, Duty says, forcing a smile, trying to douse the blue fire he sees in the man's eyes. What part of Texas? Him too? The man looms over the table, taking a step towards him. El Paso. We're both from El Paso. Duty has stopped smiling and looks blankly at Molly in front of him, trying to gauge what she's thinking and at Arnulfo, whose eyes seem cold and knowing. Bet you are. That's basically in Mexico, isn't it? Why don't you boys go back to where you came from? Excuse me? Molly says sharply. Puzzled shock blooms across Duty's face. He leans back against a hard plastic seat as if absorbing an invisible blow. Arnulfo's leg suddenly stops pumping underneath the table. Missy, if I knew you'd be giving them the magazine, if I knew you were with them, I would have kept it. Stay with your own, goddammit. Before anyone can open their mouths, before anyone can respond, the man and the woman march toward the glass doors, which swing shut behind them a second later. Duty watches the older couple lower themselves awkwardly into a metallic gray sedan not saying a word to each other. 
while Molly stared at Duty and Arnulfo, who scanned the restaurant again, empty except for a few people in the food line. Nobody has turned to look at them. Nobody is paying them any mind. Tutti thinks about the sound of his voice in English in Connecticut, that stilted border accent he never realized he had in El Paso, the dark caramel complexion of his skin when compared to Molly's glowing light tan and to the faces of the other diners. Tutti examines Arnulfo, who looks like a brawny Tarumara Indian compared to him. Tutti remembers the strange feeling repeated throughout his life, who, who he is, who he thinks he is in his mind, is sometimes not who others see or imagined he can be. The gap never seems to go away. Sometimes the secret self is comforting for its privacy. Sometimes it's amusing when he witnesses what crazy assumptions others have of him. Too often this gap is dispiriting, a prison inside of him without any means of escape. I'll stop right there. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you, Pedro. Um, that was so beautiful. And so there are so many things in it that I wanted to talk about, but I'm only going to choose a few things for right now. And later we'll talk about it more. There's that, there's that moment where, um, you know, the go, I think a lot of people can are, are familiar with that. Go back where you came from. Uh, right. phrase. Uh, and um, the complicity of, of, everyone there and how nobody looks um as if like nothing happened right. um, so when you talk about these kinds of issues how i mean how is it that that you focus on these issues in this particular book like what is it well a, a lot of it is for me you know having started uh, very poor on the mexican border you know, uh, as I tell all my Yale kids, you know, I, I started with kerosene lamps and an outhouse in the backyard. So the opposite of Andover Exeter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so going from there to where I ended up at, you know, at, in the Ivy League, um, people always uh, not just underestimate you, they assume you don't belong. Um, and and uh, I'm still the only Mexican American at the Yale program. Uh, this after decades, um, so so for me that's sort of natural um, for me to be an outsider. I mean, at this point, the odd part about it is, over time, you, I became an insider, you know, having spent so many years in these places. But I get very suspicious of them because I know I know what's behind a lot of places like like you know in the ivy league and and in and in places like connecticut um, is, that why, is that connected to the title nobody's pilgrims yeah yeah and, and it was by the way the title is an interesting story in itself so i was asked um a few years ago to give a very famous lecture called the white fund lecture it's not white people lecture it's actually the white fund lecture <laughs> and 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 this was established by judge appleton white in, in the mid-1800s, he was a contemporary of Thoreau and Emerson. And Hemingway gave this lecture. Uh, Juno Diaz gave this lecture. You know, very famous writers have given this lecture. And it's given in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And um, I gave this lecture. And, they, you know, they pay you a lot of money and you talk. And I talked about immigrants because Lawrence now is majority Latino. It's Dominican, Centroamericano, Guatemalan. It's very different from the New England that when the lecture started. And of course, one of the things I did, just to, to, to tell you where I got the title from, is I went to Harvard, being a Harvard guy, and I found Judge Appleton White's memoir, which he wrote in the mid-1800s. And what is, what is Judge Appleton White, who, who founded the, the Salem uh, Lyceum, um, is complaining about? He is complaining about the new um, English immigrants um, that it, not, not complaining about them, but he's complaining about the people who have made it in Lawrence, who are descendants of the pilgrims, and, and not being welcoming to the new English immigrants coming in <sighs> at, in the mid-1800s. So, of course, I recognize this cycle. This cycle re repeats itself, right? The mm -hmm. Jewish immigrants, Asian immigrants, Mexican immigrants, Latin American immigrants, etc. And, mm -hmm. and that's exactly, and I, and I, and I, and I 
talked about it. And so, so I, I, what I wanted to, to portray in the title was, these are the new pilgrims. These are the people coming to a hostile world where they are not wanted. And, and they have to fight for their place. And, and, and for me, I'm Aristotelian. One of my graduate degrees is in uh, philosophy, and I was writing a dissertation on Aristotle. The, the people who really understand what the American dream is about are the people who have to go through this gauntlet. The people who are born here and assume their place, they don't really understand what it is to be an American, quote unquote, or a United States citizen, unless you have to fight for it. And so that's, that's learning by doing. You know, that's very, very basic Aristotle. That's so interesting to me. So are you saying that the, the American dream inherently has to do with a shift in opportunity that you have, you start with less and then that American dream is you can work your way to getting well, more somehow or, or, or fall into luck or somehow get more. Right. Or, or, or fight for it, you know, or, or fight for it. I mean, somebody like, you know, and this is what these kids have to do. They're not wanted in their own families. They're they really only find the community with each with each other, but but in trying to fight and and I throw a lot of things at them. You'll see in this novel, people say, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe they haven't given up." And that's the whole point. The whole point is that these kids never give up. They keep fighting for themselves. They they sacrifice themselves to to save. You know, sometimes it's Molly, sometimes it's Duty, and sometimes it's Arnulfo, sacrificing themselves to keep what they want together. And, and I think that gives them a very deep appreciation of what it is to, to fight for your place, which is why what I'm saying about, uh, you know, you have to go through that gauntlet to really understand what it is to, to belong here. When, yeah. you don't, when you don't assume the privilege of belonging, you actually have to fight for it. I want to talk about that more later, um, Sergio, um, That because that uh, that's really big. But let's come back to that in a moment. Um, our final reader is Barbara Graham. She's the mother of a 50-year-old son and two granddaughters, <laughs> author of the new psychological thriller, What Jonah Knew. She's a contributor to the National Geographic Traveler, o the o o Oprah Magazine, AARP, Food and Wine, Glamour, Mindful, Red Book, Sunset, Time, Tricycle, and Vogue. All she the magazines. <laughs> Every glossy magazine. magazine. Every glossy. <laughs> also the author and editor of the New York Times bestselling Eye of My Heart, which is um, an anthology of 27 woman writers revealing the hidden pleasures and perils of being a grandmother, and author of the bestselling Women Who Run With the Poodles, Myths and Tips for honoring your mood swings. Ha 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 ha. We should that one for sure. Okay, everyone, please welcome Barbara Graham. Yay! Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all. It's so nice to be here with you. Thanks for inviting me and to be here with Dion and Sergio is a real joy and a treat. So I'm going to read from What Jonah Knew. Um, it's my first novel, um, written lots of other stuff, as you said, but first novel at, as a woman of a certain age, um, which is pretty thrilling. Um, wrote a lot of plays too, which were fiction. Anyway, this book um, is a story of two mothers and their sons. Helen's, uh, Helen is one of the mothers, her son Henry has disappeared. He's been missing for a number of years. Uh, when the novel starts, and the other mother's name is Lucy, and her son is Jonah. Um, the scene I'm going to read is from the middle of the book, when Lucy and Jonah, now this, uh, just a little background on Jonah, he's a very sensitive kid, he's been pretty anxious, he's now seven years old, suffered from night terrors, lots of anxieties, some phobias, that Lucy, his mom, has tried to figure out. She's attributed it to inherited family trauma. She had many relatives that were lost in the Holocaust. So she, she thinks it's some kind of genetic thing going on. I have an ant crawling on my screen. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so the scene that I'm going to read, Lucy and Jonah have just returned from Helen's house 
Helen's son is still missing. While they were there, at the first time they've all been together, Jonah started making comments that no one could understand. He seemed to know all this stuff about Henry, Helen's missing son that he had no earthly way of knowing. And Lucy uh, is completely flummoxed by this. They've left, they're on their way home. So this is between Jonah and Lucy. Are you mama? Am I what? Lucy's head was spinning. On the walk back from Helen's, she was clutching Jonah's hand, sufficiently aware of their surroundings to keep them from getting mangled by oncoming traffic. But that was all. What the hell? They'd stayed at Helen's long enough to make sure she wasn't about to faint again. Mama, are you? Am I what there? Lucy asked as they turned toward their house. The air was so steamy and still even the leaves on the sycamores appeared to be napping. Mad at me. No, I, I'm not mad. Of course I'm not mad at you, Jonah, but I am trying to understand what you said about how that was you in that picture and how Charlie used to be your dog and your name was Danny and Helen was your mom. Do I have that right? Jonah was zigzagging back and forth across the driveway kicking up little tornadoes of gravel along the way. Yeah, I guess, he mumbled. Honestly, sweetheart, I don't see how that's even possible. Lucy had heard of spiritual leaders like the Dalai Lama, who were supposed to be reincarnations of holy men. There had also been a lot of silly stories in the media about regular people who went through past life regression therapy in order to get in touch with their former selves who almost always turned out to be famous historical figures, such as Nefertiti or Napoleon, never your average peasant or working stiff. I could see that you and Charlie really liked each other, Lucy said, which is lovely, but that doesn't mean he used to be your dog or that Helen was your mom or it was you in those photographs. Can I have some ice cream, mama, please? I'm too hot. Lucy dug the rocky road out of the freezer and piled two generous scoops on a sugar cone, then sat down with Jonah at the kitchen table and watched him lick methodically from bottom to top to minimize drips. She wondered how it was possible to love someone as fiercely as she loved this boy, a boy who had grown from a speck to personhood inside her body and yet still be so mystified by him. She supposed that's what love is, the kind of surrender that surpasses all understanding. Because this time she couldn't explain away his behavior with her echoes of relatives killed at Auschwitz theory. And she wondered, could traces of memory be passed between people who weren't related, like Jonah and Helen's son, could Jonah be having one of those collective unconscious experiences Jung talked about, a, a concept for which he was ridiculed, ridiculed during his lifetime, but now seemed to be supported by quantum theory? When Jonah finished his cone, Lucy, Lucy gently wiped the goatee blooming on his chin with a paper napkin, then said, so can you tell me why you think Charlie used to be your dog and Helen your mom? I tried to tell you, Mama, when I was little, but you and Daddy always said I was making it up. Like Jeremy, who pretends he's from Mars to get out of broccoli because they don't have vegetables on Mars. But I was not making it up. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Bravo. <laughs> Welcome. Excellent. So I have a question. Um, yeah. So you were saying before, I, and I want to get to the narrative in a second, but I didn't want to skip over this part. Um, when you said, oh, well, um, this is my first novel, and I'm a woman of a certain age. Um, I, You know, I think it's so... <laughs> That's over, over 30. 
That would yeah. be the certain age that people are shocked that you have an, a, a debut novel. <laughs> I, I, I just think it's so brilliant that you said that. I mean, it's so it makes me think of what Michelle Yeoh said during the award ceremonies. And, she, you know, she basically said, ladies, don't ever let anyone tell you um, you're past your prime ever. Right. And I think that that is so true. You, it, you know, you can pick up and write that novel any time you hear us. You hear yes. us out there? Yes, you can. Any time. Yeah, yeah. You, you absolutely can. And for me, I, I mean, I more than anything, I'd always wanted to write novels, but I sort of segued into writing plays because I'd worked in the theater a lot and was an actor and director, and it just seemed the easier path. But truly, I... And I've written memoir and 10 million magazine articles, but writing a novel was really what I always wanted. And I feel like Michelle Yeoh, like, wow, I, I actually really did this thing that I so wanted to do for such a very long time. So yeah, That's so pretty terrific. thrilling. Was it well received by like your agent? Like when you initially said like, okay, and now I'm ready, I'm gonna write a novel. Were, were, were they open? Were they like? Um, I, it's a new agent, but the way I worked, honestly, I felt like I needed to just write this book. This book owned me. It possessed me, this story. Um, and I needed to not know if I was going to self-publish it, what was going to happen with it, whether I was going to get an agent. It, it was the way I needed to work. Um, and I'm really glad I did. And I, I have a wonderful agent who absolutely, you know, read the book, called me up the next day and said, I'm the right agent for this novel. Um, so it, and, and, and actually, and the editor who bought it at Harper had been the editor on the grandmother anthology. So that was lovely yeah. to be able to work with her again. Um, so, so I feel incredibly fortunate, but also, it's like you got to write what you got to write and not not really care so much during the process or try to tailor it to, to in any way that you think someone's going to want it, like it, because you won't do your best work. So, Barbara, how did you know this was the one? This is the one that you're going to dive in and do. You know, I, I, the, there's a story behind it. Years ago, I was living in New York. Um, I was assigned to write a uh, an article on past life regression therapy for Self Magazine. I went to a workshop, Upper West Side. All these other people were having deep experiences, nothing. Um, and then, uh, but I had to write the story for the magazine. So I went and had a private session with the psychologist, a well-known Jungian who'd led the workshop. And um, I had a really profound experience in which I saw a woman I took to be myself, who knows, no proof, uh, being killed during the Holocaust. Uh, and it was intense, powerful. And after that, um, a few days later, a friend handed me a book by a man named Ian Stevenson who was then the chair of psychiatry at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, who for many decades had been researching young children who had spontaneous recall of a previous life. He didn't really have any sort of truck with past life regression in adults because there's so many influences by the time you're a, an adult. But when you have a two or three-year-old kid who starts saying things like, you're not my mom, this isn't my house, I lived in this other place, describing how they died, it's pretty, it's pretty compelling material. And the material just completely owned yeah. me. I mean, the whole idea of past life regression is pretty hard for a lot of people, right? Um, until you actually do it, you you wouldn't actually believe it. I mean, I've actually done it, so oh. you know what you're talking about. Yeah. But I'm surprised that it sounds very theatrical too. I'm surprised that you chose to do it as a novel and not as a, a ninth, tenth play, like an extra. As a play, you mean? Yeah. Um, you know, 
I got frustrated at a certain point writing plays because <clears throat> writing a play is like scoring for actors, right? You, you get to write dialogue and stage directions, but you don't get to write the inner life, um, all the descriptive stuff. That's what the actors do. It's what the set designer does and the director. So I had this hunger to be able to write what happens inside as well as dialogue and stage directions. So um, it, it, and also it takes place over a number of years and it really, it really was a novel. It really is a novel That's more really than a play. Great. Congratulations. Like I'm gonna pull us all into the thing so we can all talk. I'd like to open up this discussion because um, you said something that was so interesting that I think really connects to the theme tonight, which is the wolves in our hearts. Um, you were talking about love and the traces of memories and um, the past and how, what do they, do they get passed down? Do they, how do, what happens in that process, right? Like what are the, the, the shadows and what are the, what's the light? And can you, can you talk a little bit about that? And, and Sergio and, and, and Dion, please feel free to, to add what you'd like. For me, I think memory comes in many different ways. I think, you know, the, the research now on epigenetics, um, memories, and I'm sure Sergio and Dion are, and all of you are, are really attuned to this in some way that we, you know, when there's trauma in a family, they, there's such good studies that that trauma is Let's passed see. is passed down genetically. It not it doesn't change the DNA, but it changes the RNA, which is how the DNA is expressed. So that's one way. I think past life memories, where where there's been trauma, and to me. It makes sense. So most of these kids, 75% of the kids with these memories recall very explicitly dying suddenly, violently, and most at a young age. So it's almost as if they have a kind of PTSD, but instead of being carried, you know, from their ancestral trauma, it comes in some way picking up, and nobody can say how, some traces of memory of another person. I mean, there are, I, I won't go into it now. I, I have a sort of understanding from the way some spiritual teachers have talked about it uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but, but it's traces. It's not like you know, the, the person, the psychiatrist who's taken over for Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia, who passed away, said it's not like Joe, D Joe Blow becomes John Doe, but more that uh, traces of consciousness somehow get transmitted, transferred. I, I do think that, um, well, in Body Keeps the Score, he talks a lot about um, how trauma gets handed down um, yeah. generationally. And I, and I think that's very true. I mean, it, you can see it in um, studies show that children of those who have been through trauma, they're at higher risk for health issues. So um, right there, you, there's something. So um, Sergio, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, for Tutti, for example, the main character, he, his ancestors are with him all the time, especially his mother, who he's an orphan. And so is Molly is an orphan. And he talks and has discussions with his mother. So she's in him, in a way, for his moral guide, because he's staying, of course, with, um, with his aunt, his mother's sister, who is the opposite of, of the mother. And so, so this is, of course, very common in, in Mexican culture, Day of the Dead, in which you see the dead not as some, 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 somebody in a mortuary, but they're present, they're in you, they're talking to you, uh, you talk to them. Uh, my muse is my grandmother, you know, who shot and killed two men who attempted to rape her during the Mexican mm -hmm. Revolution. And she was this tough as nailed lady. <laughs> and, and people want to know, well, how did you survive when you went to the Ivy League and you had no clue? <laughs> you, you, you know, it was her. You know, I, I, I called her and, and, and I said, uh, you know, Abuelita, there's nobody like me here. I, you know, what am I doing here? 
uh, I don't belong here. And she said, Sergio, don't come back with your tail between your legs. Show them who you are. Mm-hmm. You know, so she, she didn't know Harvard. She didn't know Yale, but she knew how to fight. And she stood up for herself. And I think that character, right, or character is, is really what uh, lives in me. And, and, and she will forever be my muse. Yeah. How about you, Dion? Um, yeah. Well, first, I want to say hi to Dana. I don't know how to respond to the comments. Just so. like that. Dana, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up so that you can see what, what she's responding to. Awesome. It says, <laughs> Dana Moore said, thank you, Dion, for making your book available via Audible. I love to hear literary works in the creator's voice. Looking forward to the April release of Go Back and Get It. So you must have narrated your own book. We will talk about as soon as you give your take on the inherited trauma. Because it's. I mean, that's basically what the whole point of my book was, was to go back and um, reclaim my ancestor's story. um, And in the process, also come to terms with my own story. And for me, it was extremely healing. I didn't know anything about epigenetics when I started on this journey. I didn't, I don't even, I don't think I'd ever heard the phrase, but of course, you know, as time went by, I started to read a lot about it and, you know, it certainly aligned with what my experience is. And um, (laughs) for sure there's, you know, much more research um, to be done, but, um, you know, if you're a person who believes that we're energy anyway, then it makes sense that, um, you know, um, energy remains, you know, and mm-hmm. we're affected by it. So I think the biggest gift of, of going back uh, for me was, was uh, being able to reclaim my ancestors and have them with me. Just like Sergio said, I, I got to know uh all these traditions of, you know, calling your ancestors that I had no idea about. And um, so now I feel like they're with me all the time. And, um, you know, altars for me are really important. And that was something else that I came to understand and start to practice during this process was, um, you know, being able to pay homage and respect and have conversation with my ancestors through yeah. utilizing altars. So I feel very, very close to them and so privileged to get to know them. And I hope that um, my little book is an honor to them. That's wonderful. wonderful. Can you talk now a little bit about the Audible? So did, did they ask you to read the book or did you say, I'd like to read my own book or how did oh, that work? Oh, I said, oh, absolutely not. Please go here. <laughs> actor because I have a friend actually um Orla Cassidy who who uh you know she uh, narrates books um she's a professional actress and I've seen her the preparation that goes into it it's intense it's a I mean it's for actors you know it's a real uh very important job so I said I don't think I can do this <laughs> and my um the um editor-in-chief of um of our of my uh of my um, imprint said, um, you know, I want you to just think about it because it really means a lot to the uh, readers or the listeners uh, when they can hear a memoir in the writer's voice. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think his point was for memoir in particular, um, you know, a, a, a reader or listener really wants to hear from the writer. And so I thought about it, talked to my friend, <laughs> and I figured I would give it a try. And, you know, I'm so glad that I did. It was an excellent experience for me. It was very moving for me to actually hear myself um, say these words into being. That's, wow, terrific. that's wonderful. Did either of the other two of you ever narrate your own work? Or do you have... I wanted to. They wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> I got to weigh in on who would do it, but... Um, they just, and I think it is different with memoir. Um, yes. But yeah, I would have loved to narrate this, but oh well. So awesome. I just signed an audio book deal for Nobody's Pilgrims. Oh, and congratulations! So that's, so that's Yay. coming out in, I think, a few months or so. So that's we'll see how, how that works. We'll see who reads it. Um, yeah. There's another comment here I don't want us to lose. It yes, is from awesome. Kathy in Facebook. Before this ends, wow, excellent program. I am moved and intrigued by all three books. They also uncannily interact, 
intersect, sorry, with strong interests of mine, definitely adding to my to be read piles. So thanks, Kathy. Um, we will have a link out. Um, when we send out the, the replay, we'll send out a link. We, we sell, sell all of the books through bookshop.org on our Pen Parentis shop. And then if you buy the books through the link, then Pen Parentis gets a little money. <laughs> also, we get we get the uh, the great honor of knowing that we are actually helping our authors, which is yeah. why we're here. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a really cool uh, website because it buys the books from an independent bookstore. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's near you. So you're actually keeping a brick and mortar store open near you, which yeah. is pretty hard to do these days. So it's, it's, it's a good deed. Let's talk about let's talk about writing with your kids around. Let's talk about how it is to deal with these heavy, heavy subjects or just these multiple projects or theater, like writing a play. How did you guys, did you start with, talk, talk, talk about your like intersection of the, of the writing and the kids? Um, for me, the writing of my, my first play that was, it was produced here in California and also in New York off Broadway was all about my divorce and my kid and my kid. Um, it, it, the intersection was very direct in a way, although it was, again, it was fictionalized in a fictional story, but like any fiction, it's, I think, um, or at least for me and most writers I know, it's based on some truth in your lives. And that play, I think I wrote mostly between, I don't know, 11 and two in the morning. <laughs> when, when my son was asleep, um, but uh, and and what Joan knew, I, you know, I had two granddaughters, young, very young. They're older now, thirteen and sixteen. But and and they were watching me all the time, and they just couldn't, you know, really, you're doing this, and and uh, they couldn't believe how long it took, um, and they couldn't believe, like, really, it's coming out. Oh wow. Um, because I worked on this book for a long time and did other books Good in between. For them to know that. But yeah. Good for them to be able to see it. You know, they can't know you're a writer if they never see you write. That's right. right. Well, and well, Dion, you you can speak to this a little bit. You're talking about going on vacation where you um basically do your research with the kids. Can you talk about that for everyone? I mean, absolutely. I mean, that was just the reality, you know. Uh, I mean, first of all, I want to say that I'm very grateful that I was in a position to have some help, you know, so that I could mm -hmm. have blocks of time where I could just write or whatever until my kids went to school. And then when they went to school, that was my time to write, you know, um, like many people. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, once I was really uh, intentionally researching and writing this book, there's only so much money in the in the coffers, you know? Yeah. So if we're going to get a little bit of vacation, I've also got to plan that vacation in a place where I can also get over to the archive that I need to search for that will, you know? Um, so so that is what I what I did. And you know, also, I have two daughters, and this is very much a story, I think, about Black women, my book. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was also important for me to um, demonstrate to my daughters that um, I have my own um, vocation and concerns and passions and that they were really important and, um, you know, to model that for them, you know, um, I mean, you know, their their dad is wonderful and he was very supportive. Um, but, you know, it was important for them to know that while I was staying home with them, I also did have this very <clears throat> important job. Yeah. Um, so um, writing is a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a job. It's often a thankless job. You know, it's often a job that nobody but me actually cares about. <laughs> um, but that's okay too. Like I just needed them to know that this was important to me, that it was mm -hmm. serious, that it was fulfilling for me. Um, and so, um, especially as young women and young black women that, um, that they have their own, um, interior life that is their guide. 
Wonderful. I was trying to model that too. You know, I, I think that's so interesting because I feel that way about my boys. Like I want them to know what it is to be female and Asian and, and, you know, to see me work, like work at the way I do, because that's, that's what I want them to understand when they have their families. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Sergio, how about you? Well, when my, I had two sons, Aaron and Isaac, and when they were little, uh, I was in the middle of two books that appeared earlier, Crossing Borders, Personal Essays, and then the novel from This Wicked Patch of Dust. And, and I actually structured both books so that I could write when the kids are running around crazily, you know, <laughs> and do this, wow. do that in little pieces. Mm-hmm. And so, so Crossing mm-hmm. Borders is a series of, of essays that are very tight and, and interwoven. And the novel uh, changes perspective every, every, every chapter. And so it's almost like a, a short story that's a, a collection that's really a novel. Nice. And, and so you, it, trick, it, it, you tricked your way into a long piece by right. doing little, little piece. That's right. Because, you know, and the, the, the other thing is I love being a, uh, a very involved father. And, and I, you know, I also have to thank my wife, Laura, who has a full time job as a banker. So, you know, we would just tag team, you know, um, at, if she's focusing on the kids and taking them to library day at St. Agnes here on the Upper West Side. Uh, I would be writing. I, w- I cannot lose those two hours or three hours. I have to do something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I would take, take them to school or pick them up because she's busy at work. So I think a lot of it is, is for us anyway, it was this tag team, you know, relationship in which both our, our work is, is very important. And we just have to make sacrifices, you know. It's to... surprising how precious that time gets when somebody's kind of, giving it to you like it's all a gift right you get two hours you get four hours you get some amount of time to yourself and then you have to decide what am i gonna do with my two hours do i write take a shower (laughs) well it's it's also accountability accountability right Mm -hmm. because if if laura's giving me three hours to work you know i better god then do something with that three hours (laughs) you know and it's the same thing you know with her if she has something that she really needs to work on and I'm going to take care of the kids. Well, then, you know, she has to get it done because, you know, it's, it's time is precious. I think um, that's one thing, bef- like before you have kids, and we hear this time and again, before you have kids, it's like, well, I have to be, I, I need a muse. I, I, you know, I have I to light to candles. The- <laughs> it's got to be very silent. A, no, a, nothing can be anywhere. That's a very bourgeois <laughs> concern. <laughs> you don't have that time. You got, you know, when as soon as the as soon as the kids walk out, get to work and yeah. produce something. There's no, there's no, there's no delaying. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But there's also the gift of that kind of deadline absolutely. Um, that propels propels the work when it's confined in that way. So, well, I agree. Pet Marcus has meetup groups, right? And they're accountability groups. It's our cycle of support. And um, it really is helpful for our, um, our parents. Uh, how about you guys? What, what, when you say it's good to have that deadline, how, like, you could say, well, all right, um, my, th- my deadline is next week, but is it? Like, how do you enforce those deadlines? How do you get your work done? Ask on chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I was a reporter and it was great training oh. to have to meet deadlines by the end of the day, you know, oh. like I, th- there was just no not doing that. Um, got me kind of used to being okay with not writing, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning prose. Like sometimes you just have to hand it in. Um, so that's really helpful being in groups like, you know, like the accountability group that you mentioned, I, I was in one of pen parentheses accountability groups. Yay! Yep. Um, I, you know, the group that I met you in Christina, um, I continue, you know, to meet with people. Um, and there's just, there is just something about being accountable, you know, that does make it happen. And sometimes I'll be honest, sometimes there have been long stretches where I wasn't exchanging work or meeting with other people. 
and the accountability is to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so sometimes that's where I'm at too, but yeah, for Mm -hmm. me, deadlines are really, really helpful. Yeah. Sergio. Uh, I mean, I love deadlines. I'm one of those, uh, people who, you know, set my own deadlines Mm -hmm. and whatever it takes, I really want to meet it. I I mean, I might not, I might fail, but I'll give so much effort to try to meet the deadline that maybe I'll get three quarters of the way mm-hmm. versus if I didn't have any deadline, I probably wouldn't do anything or, or much less. <laughs> so it's kind of like yanking yourself forward. If you want to hit the moon, reach for the stars, that's right. the pillow version yeah. of this. And, 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 and that I also have friends, writer friends, especially uh, from the Texas Institute of Letters, very, very important writers. We exchange manuscripts and we, mm-hmm. we basically kick each other's ass, um, you know, on, on these early manuscripts, you know, and, and I think they hold me accountable. They're waiting for my manuscript and I'm waiting for them. And, yeah. and, and these are friends that you can be very honest with, you know, including bad language and like telling them exactly where they're, they're missing <laughs> the boat. <laughs> it's good to have a writing group that you trust. Like, right. It's good to have a little community that even if it's not for necessarily workshopping, but just to know like what's out there. Has it, you know, somebody heard of a prize, somebody heard of this and the other thing, speaking of prizes, we have a fellowship that is right now open for anyone who has a child under 10 years old. Um, they have to stay under 10 until November of next year. But uh, but the prize is is doubled thanks to the DeGroat Foundation. Thank you, DeGroat. Thank you. Wow. And um, yeah, so all the prizes are doubled, Great. and uh, and it comes with the, the the money prize, and then also a year of mentorship. You get to join an accountability group. Uh, you get published by Dreamers Creative Writing Magazine, which is an international publication, very beautiful, glossy, like all of the things that Barbara has been published in, and it is. Uh, it's just a really uh, great fellowship. And so we hope that everybody out there applies, even if you're listening during playback. If you listen before April 17th, you can still apply. And the word count is super short. We change it every year because our goal with the fellowship is to get these people, you people out there, to get you all writing again. So you're, you're meant to write something new. It's like right now, I think the word count this year is 531. Like it's tiny, but you have to just do your very best and work hard and, and like get it sparkly so that so that it so that it'll win. Barbara, did you want to say something? I feel like I might have cut you oh, off. Oh no, no, not at all. No, I was really. It's just um, ass on chair for me, and early in the day, and it does help to share work um, when I'm ready. I some with with the novel. I found being in a writers group was challenging because I. I would be way ahead of where they were reading and I didn't want feedback from them. I was when I, when I was working. So I I think you have to be careful and really be ready for the feedback. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Workshops can be very tricky that way, knowing when you need that feedback and when, when it's so crucial and when it absolutely will derail you. Yeah, it can be intrusive. Right, right. Especially on a novel where, where somebody's not reading the whole thing, they might say something like, right. I need more of this stuff, front load this. And you're like, it's coming in the next chapter. Correct. Yeah, I think, I think workshops and groups um, are, are set up really well for short stories, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or essays. Or poems. Short. Yeah. Yes. Um, but then when it, or poems, but when it comes to longer, longer works, it can be difficult. Mm-hmm. I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we ridiculously are at time and you guys have been so amazing. I can't even believe that this whole hour went by like this. But what I will tell the listening audience is that the Pen Prentice Literary Salons are a monthly literary event featuring the vast diversity of writers who are also parents to highlight the fact that great writers have written great books while also being great parents. Um, so subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash penparentis. If you're watching on YouTube, just click the subscribe button. I'm like, subscribe, like, and, um, (laughs) and then they're all 
there are always playbacks so that you can always catch up on what you've missed. Um, so thanks again to the NEA, NISCA, DCLA, and LMCC for funding and to the DeGroote Foundation and Clydette out there in the front row. Hi, Clydette. Hi, Clydette. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for supporting our salons. You are all invited back, every single one of you, even everybody out there is invited back on April 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern time for the next salon. The April salon's theme is self-discovery and the readers will be Hanana Zahir, Abdul Ali, and Rosalia Scalia, which is kind of a great name. Um, also, I just want to give one last shout out to Sarah Ryan Knox, who became a member, a title member, less than an hour ago. So thanks, Sarah. Much appreciated. And, and you're welcome for hosting this SRK. Uh, <laughs> You, you loved hearing about the impact of ancestors and epigenetics. We loved hearing about it all, too. We loved hearing from Barbara and Sergio and Dion. And as always, this is Christina and I'm M.M. DeVoe. And we will see you all 